they all said they do with all the and so everything was all right. Okay, and it wasn't all right. It's had a very, very profound effect on this debate in the last year. And the fact that some companies, Tesco and Sainsbury's, Nash, have actually said, yes, we are responsible, and we're going to dip our hands in the pocket, and we're going to work with the Bangladeshis in a project that the International Trade Union Movement has been behind to improve conditions in Bangladesh factories. We're not going to say it's not our fault, we're not going to say we've got these systems that mean we're not involved, but we're actually going to proactively work with employers uh, and with others in the supply chain to make things better. It's to their enormous credit. And the fact that Gap and Asda Walmart won't is to their enormous discredit, and we need to shame those companies and those that won't join the Bangladesh Accord. And very finally, this year, after the debate about the UN Guiding Principles in the United Nations Human Rights Council, uh, uh, Ecuador led a resolution to say that there should be a working party to consult on drawing up an international convention that will be binding at the international level. Guiding Principles is great, and we achieved a lot by it, and not an alternative to it, but at the same time then talking about the next steps in terms of the issue of international law and governance on corporate responsibility. Uh, to my shame, the European Union countries didn't support that resolution, although we from the Human Rights Subcommittee of the European Parliament did, and we wrote a letter putting on, uh, to all EU member states, putting on, on record our support for that. And who knows how long that might take, it might take 10 years, it might take 20 years. But frankly, it's been the aim of many in your coalition to try and get an international UN convention on corporate accountability. And it did pass in the UN Human Rights Council, despite the fact that the Europeans didn't give their support. And it's the start of the next step of achieving what we need to achieve to ensure in this world, businesses respect human rights. Thank you very much. Thanks, Richard. So um, we've talked about um, short-termism in our financial system and in our wider economy. So it's very fitting that we have a representative here from the investment sector and even more fitting that we have Steve Waygood who's Chief Responsible Investment Officer at Aviva Investors. As Richard mentions, he leads the Corporate Sustainability Reporting Coalition and has been leading work uh, in the UN on the post-2015 development goals, really pushing forward the role of our financial system and how that affects all of us as individuals, the environment and society at large. So Steve, over to you. Thank you, Ruth. Um, it's a huge pleasure to be here today and thank you very much indeed for coming. Um, I shall be brief as I know that we're quite pushed for time and due to finish at 8. Um, so I'll, I'll make sure I try and leave a number of time for questions. It's a privilege to share the panel with so many other people doing such amazing work in the area of um, corporate sustainability, business and human rights. Um, and I've had the great pleasure of working with almost everybody on this panel um, uh, over many years. I should, do, I should do justice to Peter's work. I, I've known you for um, 15 years now <laughs> uh, uh, as we move this agenda forward. But, um, so just to uh, highlight one thing, Richard um, really does deserve a cheer. Um, I got very many <laughs> uh, while he was speaking, but none from this room. He has done phenomenal. <laughs> Thank you very much. have this non-financial reporting directive, there were times when it looked like it definitely wasn't going to happen. We, we went up against big countries that are very influential in Europe, um, and of course Business Europe itself came out very clearly against the non-financial reporting directive. Uh, they're, they're not uninfluential, so to, to get something as strong as it is, I think was huge progress. We now need to make sure it's effective, we now need to make sure it's used, and we now need to make sure the data is accessible to everybody. Um, and, and accessible in a usable way. Now I should step back, um, I, why is Aviva saying all this? Um, I work for the investment firm within Aviva. Uh, we understand um, that over the long term, it is absolutely central uh, to value creation, to be compliant with things like the Ruggie principles, to look after your customers, to look after your, um, to look after your employees, to make sure that your work, thank you for moving the mic, uh, to make sure that you're um, part, a positive, uh, playing a positive uh, part of the uh, local community. And we know that long-term value creation uh, within the businesses that we invest um, is it's cent it's central to this, this, this whole agenda. Now, what, why is there such a lack of alignment? 
It's because I think that the markets, the financial markets themselves, the incentives within the system are systematically short-term. You might have a pension, that might, you might know, many of the pensioners that we're investing money for now won't be drawing it down for 20, 30 years. Ne nevertheless, their trustees will appoint us as fund managers using an investment consultant, maybe for a year, two or three. The average uh, tenure of a pension scheme for a, a trustee board is about two and a half, three years. Um, and it's because the investment consultants that sit between a fund manager and the pension scheme are incentivized to move that scheme too often. Just to explain that a little bit, um, your trustees will be advised by an investment consultant, Towers Watson, Aon, Russell, Cambridge, these are all big, big institutions that very few people know anything about. They will say, choose this fund manager. Um, they'll get, they'll, uh, they'll, they'll turn up to the quarterly or the annual meetings between us and our clients and they'll make sure that we're held to account properly. But their incentives are 10 times, they get paid 10 times the retainer roughly every time they do a beauty parade. So in all honesty, if you're working in a commercial company, the pressures on these individuals to convince the trustees to move the money too often are too great. Now I don't have time, but I could tell you much more about the incentives in the fund management industry on stock exchanges, on brokers, the massive conflicts of interest that exist within the brokerage industry that actually mitigate against the use of the data that um, we're, we're about to get much, much more of in your investment decision making. Now the non-financial reporting directive at level two is going, is going to need much, level two will be where Europe comes together and says this is the detail that you are required to disclose. We need good guidance out of Europe. Uh, unfortunately, it looks like we might have to wait another year and a half before we get that guidance. And I worry that company secretaries are going to struggle with the directive, particularly if we're then going to review the effectiveness of the directive in, in only a couple of years uh, after that. I, I think uh, the, the long-term health of the directive may be at stake if we don't get the guidance out soon. But it's not enough. We need to make sure that the system that then takes that information and embeds it in capital allocation decisions, embeds it in voting decisions, that that system is transparent is well understood and where the private incentives of the people that work in the institutions that I described earlier, where their private incentives are much more aligned with the public good. Now Richard referred to the Sustainable Development Goals earlier, um, there is a report on the back over there, we've got a few more here. Um, we've produced a document which we hope, and I've, I've taken it to the UN a few times, I'll be there again on Tuesday at the, the Climate Summit and our Chief Executive speaking at, at the UNCTAD World Investment Forum. Um, in the middle of October to a room full of 109 heads of state to try and say to them the sustainable development goals which will replace the Millennium Development Goals and will exist for 15 years. They may be voluntary but it will mobilise a huge amount of, of resources within the UN system and it should mobilise a huge amount of action and activity. Those SDGs at the moment unfortunately I think are financially illiterate. They need to be, there's an international committee of experts study which starts to actually give more actionable suggestions, one of which, Richard touched on earlier, is that the things like the RUGI framework and the global compact standards should be embedded in investment agreements. So the International Committee of Experts in Sustainable Development Financing, their draft report, is actually an important read. Unfortunately, it's not sufficiently actionable. You can't, as a government yet, see exactly what's intended. So um, do read that document. Uh, there's a huge amount more that I could discuss here that I'd be taking from someone else's time if I carried on. Um, so please do read this. If you're interested in understanding how the markets can be harnessed to finance the future you want rather than the one you're getting at the moment because you don't frankly bother to check where your money's invested or if you do invest in a particular company, how did you vote at that AGM? How many of you have actually bothered to do that? And if you haven't and you're here in this room and you clearly care, the financial literacy of the person in the street is, is woefully below where you are at. So if you're not checking, no one's checking. And because no one's checking, there's no demand on the people that run your money to run it in a good way. So that we need to change. How do we do that long-term financial literacy measures? Now, I could carry on, but I am going to stop. <laughs> Please do read this. <laughs> such a disciplined comrade, Steve. That's very good of you. <laughs> um, Kerry, so um, you've drawn a short straw, I'm afraid. We've uh, heard all the problems that are there in our current system, and it's over to you to um, how we can put flesh to the bones of Ed's vision of responsible capitalism. 
and uh, and particularly obviously representing the Foreign Office, uh, our role of Britain in the world. Okay, yeah, um, I think the, the other problem, obviously, with following uh, three excellent speakers who've gone into so much detail on it that I'm sitting there crossing out, crossing out. <laughs> this is which is probably good, you know, it fits into the uh, the time that we have available. Um, I'm sorry I was late. I was in, um, I had to go to a composite meeting on the, there's a global human rights um, composite uh, resolution that's being put forward tomorrow on Qatar and Colombia. Um, and so I had to sort of make sure we did the tweaking on that. But you, there means that there will be a debate on the, the floor of conference tomorrow, which is really good news. Um, I'm, I'm going to talk, I think, actually from the sort of broader principles of what a Labour approach to business and human rights should look like. Um, the starting point is obviously Britain is a trading nation. Um, our, our entire country has been built on trading links, exporting overseas, investing overseas, um, other countries selling us goods and investing in the UK. And we are also a country that prides itself on valuing human rights and taking a lead on that international, nationally. And the, the, the issue that I've been grappling with as Shadow Human Rights Minister um, is whether it is possible to square the two. Um, you remember that Robin Cook famously spoke of an ethical foreign policy um, when, when he was Foreign Secretary. With, I'll just want to say a little bit about the, the current government's approach. David Cameron said when, um, in his very early days in number 10, that he wanted a more commercial foreign policy and that he wanted to place our commercial interests at the heart of our foreign policy. William Hague then said um, the promotion and protection of human rights is at the very heart of our foreign policy. And I suppose the, the question would be whether human rights and commercial interests can both be there. Can the two hearts beat as one? Or, or, as I would argue, has the government instead taken the approach of prioritising commercial interests over and above anything else, very mercantilist approach to foreign policy? What they have done is they appointed Saeed Avasi, Banas Varsi in the House of Lords as the FCO Minister for Human Rights. She's now been replaced by Baroness Anna Lee, because as you know, she resigned over Gaza. What I think that has done is it's given the rest of the FCO and all the ministers in other departments, particularly Biz, but also um, the Education Department, um, any, any department where there's a, a, an interest in the UK investing overseas, um, DCMS, for example, it's given them leeway to put human rights very much on the back burner. So Baroness Varsi will be off going to various human rights uh, conferences, particularly she's been um, very focused on freedom, uh, protecting the freedom of religion. And what I think has happened in other regards is the government has very much treated human rights as a tick box exercise. So the very the most junior member of the delegation will speak to the most junior member of the, the people they're visiting and at some point sort of flag up, well, we're a bit worried about this, we're a bit worried about that, and they can say that they've done it. But it's not something that they use the, uh, the commercial side, the business side, as leverage to actually achieve movement. And I've tried asking, I, I tabled some questions um, to David, you remember David Cameron took the biggest delegation ever, biggest trade delegation ever to China, I think just before Christmas, about 40 companies. And I just tabled some questions saying, will you bring up human rights? And... Um, I also asked when he went to Saudi Arabia with lots of arms manufacturers or defence companies. And the, the sort of answer you get back is nothing was off the table. Um, we discussed a broad range of issues. Nothing was off limits. And it's, yeah, and that to me is basically saying, no, we didn't discuss it. Um, Boris Johnson and George Osborne went to China shortly before David Cameron did. And Boris said, when he was asked um, about his, his visit, he said, I don't just walk into a meeting and say, I say you chaps, how's freedom doing? <laughs> Something. So in other words, yeah, purely about business. Michael Fallon, who was business minister, he went to China. He said, these things get raised, but we should not allow them to get in the way of a very important and deepening trade relationship. And what actually happened with David Cameron, he was refused. He was, he was due to go to China. And because he met the Dalai Lama, the Chinese refused to host him and it got put back. So that's kind of like a shot across the bowels. Don't ever mention Tibet when you... Um, when you want to do business with, with China. Um, Nick Clegg did similar when he went to um, Colombia. And um, I actually reported him to the, the, it was the uh, House of Commons Procedures Committee because he just wouldn't tell me what he had discussed and um, wouldn't say whether he'd raised human rights. 
Um, I will skip over things like the, the Modern Slavery Bill and that which we've, um, which has already been mentioned. Um, the government did publish a action plan on business and human rights just over a year ago, beginning of September last year. And what I'm pushing for at the moment is, well, I'm, what I'm trying to find out is whether businesses who go on these delegations are actually informed about the Business and Human Rights Action Plan. It's not which point having an action plan has been criticised by lots of campaigners for um, uh, the, the section on um, ac improving access to remedy is very weak. Um, it's sort of rather retrospective and vague. It's not really a forward-looking action plan. But I think the key thing is if Nick Clegg is going to Columbia with lots of business people, I want to know that at some point those that those people on that delegation have been told about the human rights situation in Colombia and particularly the, the situation with regards to trade unions. I also think there ought to be a human rights expert that goes on that trade delegation as well and factors in, in into each of the meetings. But as I said, it's, it's very difficult to find out whether this is happening. And I think the I know I know certainly when the um, the trade envoy went to Chogham in Sri Lanka. He didn't have any discussions about human rights before he went, which I think is, is actually quite shocking. Um, one, one thing I just want to flag up is the role of the Export Credit Guarantee Department, which is now called UK Export Finance, um, which underwrites loans, um, particularly uh, for arms and oil companies. Um, one of the things when Vince Cable got, Vince Cable is responsible for it, uh, is he flagged up that he wanted to not give export credit for any environmentally damaging things. I think Amnesty have done quite a lot of work on that. And yet they've committed $1 billion to support deep sea drilling in the South Atlantic, um, despite the fact they've been warned that there were potentially adverse environmental impacts. They've also supported um, coal mines in Russia. So again, this is something where I think we need to look very closely at whether we're, and it's not human rights, environmental rights, environmental damage, I think it's all part and parcel of the same thing. And as Richard says, um, the League Changes to Legal Aid Action, uh, Legal Aid, Access to Legal Aid, as will have a big impact on people um, uh, actually doing business. And I'm now, I just want to say a few words, I mean, Ed, I think it was at last year's conference, wasn't it, where he set out his vision for responsible capitalism. And I think, you know, what we need to do, a lot of the discussion on policy within the party has been within the One Nation framework, so it's quite inward looking, you know, the problem with the FCO is you're not talking about One Nation, you're talking about all the other nations. Um, what I think we need to do is to see how we can transpose the same principles to how we do our foreign policy. I think um, Jim Murphy has done excellent work on exposing what's happened in Qatar with um, the migrant workers. I just got back from Nepal and um, was talking there about, you know, because it's, uh, a lot of Nepalese have, have died working out there. Um, Rana Plaza, Richard has already mentioned. Um, the government has actually cut funding to the ILO, which is something that we desperately ought to be supporting, and the TEC have got a campaign to get Qatar to recognise um, ILO standards. Um, so the, the, final, the final thing I would mention is about free trade agreements and TTIP. I mean, Richard is far more of an expert on, on these issues than I am because he's very much involved at the, the heart of negotiating this. But I was in, it sounds like I just do nothing but travel. I was in El Salvador a few weeks ago and talking to people there about CAFTA, the, the free trade agreement. They've got a couple of court cases at the moment where, for example, uh, Monsanto are all over El Salvador. Um, there's a real growing organic um, agriculture movement, move towards sustainable agriculture. And going back, they want to promote native seeds. So it's, um, you know, sustainable organic agriculture. They are now being sued for wanting to do that. And the other thing they want to do is to ban pesticides or to stop pesticides being uh, uh, sort of promoted in El Salvador. And on both fronts, it's seen as, um, or people are arguing it's in restraint of free trade because um, it stops the likes of Monsanto selling their pesticides, selling their seeds in El Salvador. And I think we've got to look very closely at that, that sort of detail in agreements um, as to whether... Um, I think we get too caught up in the, the overriding argument about free trade and we sometimes, it's very easy, particularly with TTIP, to look, at the moment TTIP, the, the arguments are all about the NHS and the impact on the NHS. And 
it's only now that people are beginning to flag up the fact that it could have consequences in terms of environmental rights, climate justice as well. So um, that's something that I, I definitely want to do a bit more work on. But um, I suspect that will, the first step in that will probably involve talking to Richard because he has probably done an awful lot of it already. We're really running up against time, but we did start a bit late, so I'll just take one round of questions in a round of three, if that's okay. So, yeah, maybe we'll pick that. Um, I'm Jocelyn Scott, County Councillor for Cambridge. I'm glad that Bhopal was mentioned because one of the problems there was that the Indian government began criminal prosecution against the union car by head honchos, and gradually that was watered down and watered down. And that was because, I expect, the Indian government was dependent on companies like Union Carbide to provide jobs. So I get to the point here. It seems to me that we need to start thinking about environmental crimes as crimes against humanity, because then the International Criminal Court could deal with it. They can't deal with Bhopal, but happened before the International Criminal Court came into existence. But that would then mean that there is an alternative route for action to be taken against companies that do, as was done in Bhopal, and it wouldn't all be dependent upon governments, which we don't feel sorry for them, but we have to understand, particularly in developing countries, they are dependent on large corporations to provide jobs. Yep. Um, my name is Zayn Azada, I'm from the International HIV AIDS Alliance. Um, I'm just wondering if the panel can perhaps give their perspective on the kind of role reversal of corporates and, and the state in cases where the state is the perpetrator of human rights abuses. Um, the International HIV AIDS Alliance works a lot on LGBT rights around the world and we're trying to challenge criminalisation of homosexuality in countries such as Uganda, Nigeria and India. And they're actually working with Brunswick to Brunswick PR to build a coalition of businesses against um, homophobia, state sorts of homophobia particularly. And so I'm just wondering if the panel have any thoughts on such circumstances and the, and the corporate role, or perhaps how corporates can work with the UK or the UK government. Thank you. Just one more, please. Uh, yep, the gentleman. <coughs> I'm Bill Edwards, I'm PPC for various endeavours. Um, very much with you about regulation. But really, the important thing is enforcement. Mm. And uh, if you are dealing parts of the food business, as I do, um, you have to realise how many false certificates of origin there are in the world. If you look in the world trade statistics, Singapore is a major producer of palm oil. There is not a single palm oil tree in Singapore. That palm oil has been grown somewhere else illegally. And say with cocoa. Um, Ivory Coast cocoa was always cheaper than Ghana. When I worked for Roundtree's, we wouldn't buy it. The reason it turned out to be cheaper was it was grown by slave labour. And it's fairly notorious that Ghana cocoa can walk and become Ivory Coast, and Ivory Coast can walk over the border in the other direction and become Ghana. So if you try banning things, you have problems. I mean, to take a simple European example, if you look at the production of olive oil, the recorded figures for France and Italy and Spain are not biologically possible. It's not olive oil or it's not grown there. Hopefully, it is olive oil and it's come from the south of the Mediterranean. But I hope you're given the idea of what can be done. There's a shrub. It grows in Iran only. It produces a gum called gum tragacan. It has some food and pharmaceutical uses for which there is no substitute. The USA has an embargo on Iran. American companies have to have this. Theirs grows in Switzerland. So I hope you realise what you have to do at the level of regulation. Because I assure you, some of these things are more bent than a Liberal Democrat policy. <laughs> 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 um, right, Peter, if we could start with you, please, um, to be on the uh, first question. Yeah, thank you. Um, I'm Jocelyn Scott, I'm the Indian Council for Cambridge. Um, I'm very interested in the role of corporates and the role of the state in the UK in terms of the role of the state in terms of the role of the state in terms of the which ties the hand of the Indian government to hold um, uh, Dow Chemicals now um, accountable. So, so that is um, an issue. Um, with regard to, yes, business... We do need to vacate this room now. Um, we have the room to 8 o'clock, and we, we need to get the wall out. So I'm so sorry to interrupt right. speaking, but... Sorry, everyone. I didn't realise there was a room outside. Okay, sorry. Thank you. Sorry. Thank you very much.